thank you very much for being here. It's thank great you. To have you. Great to have you. Um, and I'd like to start uh, some of these questions on interlingually speaking with the general question on what type of life subtitling do you do? And by that I mean, do you do intra or inter? And do you do TV or other context? Um, the kind of subtitling, of live subtitling I do, uh, is mostly intralingual, meaning from Italian into Italian. Uh, but let's say that uh, once or twice a month, I'm also asked to do uh, interlingual um, subtitling, and mainly for conferences. On TV, it's quite rare that um, you are asked to do interlingual subtitling. And when you do interlingual live subtitling, I imagine that you, you mean interlingual really speaking? That's what I do because this is the technique I master. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the normal conditions for that type of interlingual really speaking job? What do you mean? Uh, I mean the setup. Uh, okay, working conditions. Yeah, working. Uh, the kind of working conditions that I'm normally used to uh, are a, a microphone, which can be a steno mask, or um, if I have uh, the possibility of sitting in a, in a soundproof booth uh, to use uh, a normal uh, microphone. Um, and then I have the o I normally have the audio input uh, into my uh, earphones, um, and uh, but sometimes uh, they don't have a, a booth and they don't have a mixer, so I'm asked to to sit close to the speaker so that I can hear what he or she says and do uh, re-speaking in uh, a uh, steno mask. Um, this is the minimum, steno mask and, uh, and uh, the possibility of hearing the audio. As for the subtitles, uh, they uh, uh, normally appear on, uh, on a second, on a separate screen, but more and more we use uh, text on top, uh, which is a radio system that allows uh, two computers to talk to each other and to send uh, uh, subtitles on the same screen as the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, Carlo, this is just by the way, is it, is it okay to, con to mention financial conditions or should we not mention it? Is it confidential information to say how much one charges, how much? We just want to make sure that... Oh, the problem is that... Um, we can say like interpretation or a little bit more without mentioning the figures. Uh, uh, the, problem with, 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 the problem with mentioning the figures is that uh, the working conditions in Italy are not the same as in in other countries and um, even in Italy yeah. they, vary. they vary a lot because there are very few uh, people doing this so the people who train mm -hmm. for a company yeah. um, the company wants a markup right. takes, uh, takes part of the uh, 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 I mean if the company does the marketing so you don't have to look for clients. Yeah. The company is going to offer don't know, the same as me, mm -hmm. but part of what they get is for them. Yeah. So interlingual speaker may listen uh, 750 and then they are paid 400. Yeah, yeah. They don't like it. I yeah. don't think yeah. that That's financial conditions, but, maybe, but maybe comparing, with, yeah. comparing yeah. with interpreting is uh, uh, a solution. How do you see the job of an interlingual speaker? How do you see that profession? What kind of professional are you there? And therefore, what kind of conditions should you have in terms of financial remuneration as well? So, what kind of profession is this? An interpreter? Is this a. Uh, well, I have a um, conference interpreting background. So, I see, uh, especially re speaking, but live subtitling in general, as more an interpreting job, meaning a skill that an interpreter uh, can have in his or her portfolio um, uh, more than uh, a, a skill that uh, a subtitler of pre-recorded uh, programs uh, should possess. I see that the, the two professions, live subtitling and subtitling, as two very different uh, professions because in terms of skills, in, um, um, 
there are not so many in common. There are more skills in common with the simultaneous interpreter uh, than with the um, pre-recorded subtitler, especially if we consider that uh, that interlingual uh, uh, live subtitling includes simultaneous interpreting. Mm -hmm. And therefore, do you think that the remuneration should be more similar to simultaneous interpreters? I'm talking about interlingual English speakers or interlingual live subtitlers than to that of subtitlers, do you think? When you talk of interlingual uh, live subtitlers, be they re-speakers or typists, um, the remuneration uh, and the working conditions should be the ones of uh, interpreters, of simultaneous interpreters. And when I say working conditions, I mean uh, that normally simultaneous interpreters are two while uh, uh, working. And uh, at the beginning, uh, intralingual uh, live subtitling has been, at least in Italy, a, a job that one person could do for one, two, even three hours alone. Um, when it comes, and it is hard, when it comes to interlingual uh, live subtitling, um, it is not a continuation of intralingual live subtitling. It is a continuation of simultaneous interpreting. So the working conditions should be the same, meaning two people, at least two people, uh, doing the job, especially if it is for television where uh, speech rate is much higher than in conferences. And how do you compare the different types of interlingual live subtitling? That is, using maybe text or, you know, like typing or re-speaking. I mean, how do you compare in two terms? Um, in terms of the quality uh, and in terms of the, yeah, of the difficulty, the complexity involved. What do you think? Can I mention people? Yes, you can, of course. Um, yeah. As for techniques, there are different tec techniques to produce interlingual live subtitles. Um, one is respeaking, um, and and but also there are but there are also people who are able to do uh, interlingual live subtitling uh, with uh, typing machines, mm -hmm. and by typing machines I mean velotyping, I mean uh, stenotyping, palantyping, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and, and these people uh, are really good in intralingual live subtitling. Um, the reason why uh, re-speaking is more um, used by a simultaneous interpreter is because uh, they are used to the effort of listening and speaking at the same time. Um, and the problem with listening and speaking at the same time is that uh, it is a, uh, cognitively it is uh, a hard job to do, uh, more difficult than typing. Not because typing is difficult, but because it uses, re-speaking uses the same uh, channel, the acoustic channel, uh, to uh, uh, receive and produce the, um, the text. Um, and this is also why um, typing is probably uh, easier to use uh, for producing uh, better quality um, subtitles, not because they are uh, better in doing the job, it is simply a technique, but because it involves less stress. Uh, I'm not a specialist of uh, stress management, but I see, uh, for example, my friend Wim Heerbeek, uh, he is a very good uh, subtitler, he is also an interlingual uh, live subtitler. Um, he does a lot in the field of interlingual live subtitling in Europe and uh, he can do eight hours alone. Um, probably there are not so many people like him With but at the same he he uses he uses velotype uh, but at the same time um, at the same time I I'm sure that um, the same job done by a superman like him uh, through re-speaking, uh, is not that easy to, to do. At the same time, re-speaking is easier to learn, mm -hmm. especially for interpreters. Can you see any context where it is not feasible to provide high quality interlingually spoken subtitles? Um, well, if you mean re-speaking, 
um, I, I see the um, I see several contexts where respeaking is uh, difficult to use, especially in interlingual uh, live subtitling cases. Um, for example, conversations. It is very hard to produce uh, uh, intralingual live subtitles in conversations. So I think that uh, in the case of interlingual live subtitling, this is more the case. Um, uh, um, working meetings, uh, when uh, subtitles are, are also provided uh, when you are in a meeting uh, or, for example, in um, uh, the board of directors meetings. In these settings, it is more difficult to produce uh, good quality in interlingual life subtitles. But the reason here is that um, people doing this job are normally not people uh, involved in the same field. So these people share a common knowledge that the re-speaker doesn't have. Uh, so it is diff and, and it is usually very technical. So usually here uh, re-speakers have problems. But the main problem to me is uh, conversation. So when there is a lot of uh, turn taking, uh, so uh, chat shows on TV uh, or Yes, settings lie, working meetings. Um, how do you, have you ever tried to assess the quality of the interlingual re speaker in and interlingual life subtitling output? How do you assess that? You know? I have tried to uh, assess the quality of interlingual life subtitles. I used a taxonomy which is based on idea units. Um, because in interlingual live subtitling, it is very difficult to do a lexical comparison. Uh, so, um, you know, what is important, and this is also what interpreters normally do, is to understand if the target text, so meaning the subtitles, um, contain the same ideas expressed in uh, the source text. At the same time, you can also assess uh, mistakes when they happen. And here I'm talking of recognition mistakes in the case of re-speaking. Um, there you, uh, you can see if there is a mistake. At the same time you can tell if that mistake is important or not, is relevant or not for understanding or for uh, reading speed. Um, but most of it, most of the quality, most of the assessment is based on the rendition of idea units. Um, what do you think are the skills that are required for a good interlingual re-speaker? The qualities that are required to an interlingual uh, re-speaker, and I would not say good, I would not talk of good interlingual right, live subtitles because uh, the interlingual live, prof um, live subtitler uh, is a profession that demands for competencies. If you do not have those competencies, you cannot be called an interlingual live subtitler. Um, so uh, you need to combine the intralingual uh, skills and the simultaneous interpreter skills, um, meaning that uh, you have to be, uh, plus you have to be very quick in rendering um, um, the, the the source the, the the target text. Why? Because especially on television, times are very uh, are, are very strict, and uh, there is, for example, a difference between simultaneous interpreters for conferences and simultaneous interpreters for uh, TV. On TV, uh, simultaneous interpreters are asked to talk at the same time as. Uh, the speaker, w without delay, delay basically. So uh, the same is true here in interlingual live subtitling when it is used for uh, um, uh, on TV, because on top of that, there is a delay due to the recognition of uh, the words produced by the speaker by the machine. So uh, the delay is more important in interlingual live subtitling than in uh, simultaneous interpreting. And the delay is more important in re-speaking than with uh, typing techniques. Because when you type, the word 
immediately comes out while in uh, 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 in respeaking, uh, the issue, there is an issue when there is a lot of work that the software has to do. So um, uh, you have to be uh, quicker than a, uh, an average uh, simultaneous interpreter. Uh, you have to ha possess um, training, um, translational uh, inter interpreting skills. Uh, you have to um, be able and do uh, more psychocognitive tasks than a simultaneous interpreter because you also need to introduce punctuation, you have to speak um, clearly and this is something that simultaneous, interpreter, simultaneous interpreters are not asked to do. They do, but they are not asked to avoid extra sounds or to articulate every single syllable. Um, at the same time, um, there is an important aspect that we have not mentioned yet, meaning editing. Editing is something that uh, either the live editor can do, so a second professional, or the re-speaker himself or herself. And when it is the re-speaker himself or herself who needs to care about the editing of the target text, this is a, a, another skill that he or she has to possess because while we're speaking, while listening to the source text, while paying attention to produce a good text, he or she also has to pay attention to a third text, which I call the mid-text, which is the, the, the text that uh, is going to be the text read by the audience. And if there is a mistake there, you need to uh, both assess the quality of uh, that text plus edit in case. There are some people, uh, maybe from the, especially perhaps from the interpreted world, who when listening to that they say, okay, so interlingual re-speaking is not feasible if you are also asked to do that, to, to look at your own output and maybe correct your mistakes and maybe, does it make it not feasible or is it still feasible? Well. Um, when I'm asked, how can you possibly do simultaneous interpreting by an average person who doesn't know what simultaneous interpreting is, um, I have to explain them that it is something that you get uh, through training. Um, the same is true for driving. The same is true for whatever other Mm, task that re requires multitasking skills. Um, of course, simultaneous interpreters are more um, know more uh, they professions, so they have uh, more um, uh, more feedback, more background to assess the difficulty of a job in interlingual live subtitling, and especially in interlingual re-speaking. Uh, but at the same time, again, this is something that comes through um, the comes to, through training. Um, for example, um, uh, simultaneous interpreters. When I tell them, when I train them to uh, um, interlingual speaking, they say, uh, "But it's difficult to also add punctuation because you need to think in diamesic terms, uh, meaning you need to talk to think in." Uh, in terms of producing something that is going to be read. But again, this is something that it is uh, semi-automatized very quite easily, because uh, once you are in, uh, w once you have the mindset that, um, that allows you to, uh, to, to, autom to sort of automatically introduce punctuation, you don't even think of it. It's something that comes naturally. Plus, um, however, the question of uh, doing the quality control and uh, correcting the mistakes is something which is uh, which cannot be uh, semi-automatized. Um, it is something that is demanding in terms of cognitive wor workload. So, if the um, source text is easy, for example, uh, uh, a conference, uh, again, here we should make a difference between. I don't know, medical conferences where the topic is very uh, demanding or general uh, conferences. For example, I'm used to subtitle uh, <coughs> conferences uh, 
about deafness and about uh, topics that I know. The knowledge of the topic you are going to subtitle, again, is a another skill that simultaneous um, interlingual live subtitlers should possess. Uh, but this is something that also interpreters uh, have to do. I mean, if you are going uh, to interpret, if you interpret for a medical conference, uh, you should know something about uh, the topic that they are going to deal with. <clears throat> but of course, this adds uh, more cognitive load. That is why, in given contexts, um, it is important to have a live editor, meaning somebody that uh, does the job for you. And by job I mean uh, the job of assessing the quality of the output of the re-speaker and uh, editing in case um, there are mistakes. You're saying that a live editor may be needed in difficult contexts where they're quite specialized and therefore more correction is needed, etc. So you would like to have that live editor, but at the same time by having that live editor you're adding extra delay to a task where you thought the, uh, shortening the delay was essential. So how do you negotiate that contradiction, if you can include it in your answer? Um, here there may be a contradiction, meaning that uh, adding a live editor implies adding a delay, uh, which is uh, one of the most important points in, uh, in live interlingual live subtitling, but live subtitling in general. However, here we uh, should think that uh, um, the working conditions and the average delay depends on the countries, because normally uh, in the UK, um, live intralingual uh, uh, subtitling is, di is done by one single person, while, for example, in France or in Italy it is done by two people. So there are already two people doing the job and there are already uh, live editors out there. So um, it depends on the standard delay that you uh, talk about. At the same time, uh, there may be uh, solutions uh, for avoiding this delay. Uh, one is the antenna delay, but here uh, there are problems with betting and or censorship uh, that that are, um, are a concern for uh, broadcasters. Um, as for uh, the delay, there are there is a special tool that allows for uh, aligning the uh, source text with the subtitles. Um, so that you have interlingual live subtitles appearing at the same time as uh, the source text. Of course, this is can, this can also this can only be possible um, for something that is broadcast or web broadcast. We have said that uh, in TV broadcast, this is not possible for betting reasons, etc. But if you think of conferences being broadcast. Um, um, uh, or for uh, other live events that are broadcasts through uh, social networks or YouTube or other uh, web platforms, um, adding this, uh, uh, doing this alignment is uh, very, very easy. Of course, it is not possible to do so uh, when you are in a live conference and you are an attendee of a conference uh, live. Uh, but here the problem is less important because um, a speaker normally speaks for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, so having a 10 second delay is not that, um, is not that important. Um, uh, Carlo, for training, uh, what do you think are the, what modules would you have in a training program for, by modules I mean subjects, right? subjects. What modules or subjects would you have or components would you have for a, to train an interlingual speaker? If I think of uh, a program for training interlingual speakers, I would um, use a module, um, a program that is modular, first of all, because uh, people being trained to interlingual uh, re-speaking are uh, people who come from dif different backgrounds. Um, 
a pers a novice, a person who doesn't have any knowledge of simultaneous interpreting, of subtitling, uh, of intralingual live subtitling, nothing at all. Um, I would uh, see at least four modules. One module being the module uh, explaining what the profession is. Um, fees, um, working conditions, uh, needs and, expecta ex and expectations of uh, the audience, ca ca possible kinds of audience, possible channels, possible text types. This knowledge is basic. It is very important uh, to acquire as a knowledge. Then I would concentrate another module on the technique uh, because uh, you need to acquire the technique to be able and uh, uh, easily uh, concentrate on what is the uh, most important part of interlingual live subtitling, meaning the uh, interpreting part. So uh, I would have a third module on uh, interpreting, um, and then a part where the two things are put together, meaning the, the re-speaking part and the um, interpreting part. And uh, finally, uh, a last uh, module, uh, where the um, multimodality um, is um, the, the management of the multimoda of multimodality is taught because in interlingual live subtitling uh, there is a lot of multimodality that you have to deal with. For example, in conferences when speakers read their slides, what you do you have or where images are important you have to uh, let the audience concentrate on the images especially if you have a second screen you have to let people concentrate on that slide and maybe you can uh, teach also these practical things that in the end are very important and finally knowing uh, the technology available because uh, many times people uh, I have trained ask me for um, solving problems to them. So if I had taught them all the technology available, they will not ask this. And if you are in a conference and you haven't realized that you need one tool, for example, a steno mask, uh, you can't do the job. So knowing that in advance allows you to uh, be able and solve all possible professional problems. Um, three very quick questions to finish with. First, um, what are three very quick aspects that you think research in interlingual re-speaking should focus on? Three or two or one, whatever. Well, I think more than three. Because uh, research in interlingual live subtitling, uh, to me, should concentrate on uh, um, the uh, skills involved in the training, um, in... Uh, testing the different possible solutions, um, investigating human-machine interaction, uh, which is one of the main elements of uh, interlingual live subtitling, because you have m a lot of technology involved in that. Um, uh, of course, the, result, the quality of uh, the subtitles, meaning the delay, uh, the mistakes, so research should also focus on uh, uh, ta taxonomies to, you, to, to assess the quality of uh, live interlingual subtitling, um, but also language pairs, because maybe there is a difference. The, the difference in subtitling from English into Italian and from English into Dutch, for example. In that regard, directionality, are you thinking interlingual re speakers should always re speak into the mother tongue or not necessarily? Well, not necessarily, because I have done. Um, um, there is one thing in common between simultaneous interpreters and uh, interlingual live subtitlers, meaning uh, are in, should interlingual live subtitlers uh, translate translate only in um, subtitle only in their mother tongue? Um, and this is a question that also simultaneous interpreters have gone through, because at the beginning uh, simultaneous interpreting was only done. Um, 
uh, into their mother tongue. Uh, and this is also the policy of the European Union, where simultaneous interpreters only tr um, work in their uh, uh, mother tongue, except for special cases. Um, in interlingual live subtitling, depending on the technique, uh, it may be more or less recommended to work into uh, your uh, mother tongue. For example, in typing, if you know the spelling of words, you don't necessarily need to be a um, mother tongue of English, a native speaker of English, uh, because uh, because if you can type and if you can type quickly and if you can type accurately, you don't need to be uh, a, a native speaker of English. Um, with re-speaking, there is a problem. Um, it is a little bit more difficult because even though you have a very good pronunciation in English, even though people uh, understand you when speaking English, even though people tell you, ah, oh, you look like uh, a native speaker, you are not. And phonemes are more difficult to capture by the machine than graphemes. Graphemes are the, the mechanical result of a, a finger touching a key, while phonemes, uh, especially if you think of English, there are so many phonemes, especially especially vowels, that are not there in in uh, in other languages. For example, in Italian, you only have five vowels. <laughs> in English, you probably have twenty. So the difference between uh, the, the different vowels uh, and are demanding, especially in when uh, uh, very short words are uh, are there. Uh, in English, you have uh, m many short words, uh, words with one syllable, two syllables, and these words uh, look like other words. So there are a, a lot of near homophones in English. So we're speaking. Uh, for a non-native speakers, re-speaking from uh, into English is uh, quite demanding, but it is not so for uh, people who are not native speakers of Italian, of Spanish, of uh, other easier, uh, phonetically speaking, um, languages. I have done inter uh, interlingual re-speaking from Italian into English, and technology is quite advanced, and the result was quite acceptable. Um, however, the situation was um, a comfort uh, situation because I know the topic and because the people uh, whom I was uh, subtitling for were people I know. And third, um, they were speaking uh, quite slowly, let's say 80, 90 words per minute. To finish with, um, in, in our team there's people, there are people who think that interlingual we speak in as a term doesn't make <coughs> sense because you're not speaking, you're translating. Um, so you wouldn't be re-speaking interlingually. Uh, and they talk about trans-speaking, to what extent that makes sense, I know. And the other one is interlingual life so tightly, or should we call it interlingual life tightly, given that in live events you are not putting your, your words underneath an image very often. Sometimes you are, sometimes you are not. So is there a need to change? Can you really talk about interlingual re-speaking? Should we talk about it because that's what people would know more easily? Or does it need another term? And the same thing for tightly and subtitling. The terminology thing is something which is uh, very complex. And there is a lot of terminology out there that make things very difficult to understand. Um, starting from subtitling. Um, subtitling is a word that means titles under something. So this is a word that comes from uh, uh, movie studies, from cinema studies. Uh, however, there are many settings where subtitles are put on top of the, of the screen or at the side of, of the screen, so you should speak of uh, sir titles, as it happens with opera titles, or lateral titles, which is a word that is uh, basically uh, something that only um, linguists use. Um, so I would go for titling instead of subtitling because of this. Though titling is a word that should take a lot of time before uh, being uh, used by non-specialists. Um, 
Then, as for uh, uh, the profession of the of the person doing the subtitle, the, the titling, um, again, I would not concentrate on the technique, but rather I would concentrate on the final result because it is the final result that you do. So, um, talking of re-speaking, which is a technique, it's misleading to me because. Um, uh, the, it is the final result, the thing that matters. I mean, if you are a subtitler, think of a, of a subtitler. Uh, you are not a keyboard subtitler. You are not a speaking subtitler. You are not, uh, I don't know what, subtitler. You are, you are simply a subtitler. So when it comes to uh, live subtitles, you are a live subtitler. And, and in this case, a live titler. Uh, okay, so no matter what the technique is, um, so somebody from the profession can ask you, are you a re-speaker, are you uh, uh, a, a, a typist or not? But the technique doesn't, ma doesn't really matter. Um, uh, what matters is the final result, so I would call the professional a live titler. That's all. Um, as for interlingual uh, live subtitling, um, the, the difficult thing is that uh, um, the final result is different from the target text. So probably here the mention of interling interlingual is important. So interlingual live titler may be a solution. Um, um, should we have, if we had a word for live titling, probably we would be happy with only two words, uh, interlingual life titler or intralingual life titler. To me, this is the, the difference. I would not mix two things that have nothing in common, the technique and the final result. So talking of trans speaking, to me it's not uh, it's not correct. Uh, naming uh, skills to me is very difficult because there are how would you call a, a person doing interlingual live titling through stenotype, through velotype, through palantype? Would you call it a a, 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 tra a, trapalant, a transparent, <laughs> I don't know, it is very difficult. I would not mix uh, the technique and the final result. Excellent. Carmen, we have finished, but any, uh, I don't know, what, uh, you know, where do you see this going? Um, what do you see interlingual me speaking, uh, interlingual life subtitling going? You think, you think it's going to take off, you think it's going to be, or is it just too early to talk about this and it's just, you know, it could just end up in nothing? I think that it's not too early to talk about uh, interlingual live subtitling because when companies realize that thanks to uh, uh, interlingual live subtitling you have the possibility of giving people, the audience, the same um, product as simultaneous interpreting um, without spending money and time on uh, uh, technical things um, and uh, they, they see the value of it. Plus, if uh, they understand that they can have access to uh, the subtitles being produced to produce the proceedings of their conferences or of their meetings, they really appreciate uh, this job. By saying this, I don't mean that simultaneous interpreting uh, is less value than interlingual uh, live subtitling. But I think that in the future, um, people will be more and more called, I, I talk of simultaneous interpreters, are going to be more and more called to be able and also possess um, in interlingual live subtitling uh, skills. And uh, when I say so, I usually compare um, what happens in the audiovisual translation field. Um, 20 years ago, you had a very uh, clear scenario of the subtitling countries, of the dubbing countries, of the voiceover countries. 
um, with introduction of uh, digital terrestrial television, of HBB, and of other, and of uh, web-based television, um, a, a lot of uh, countries have seen a mixture of uh, audiovisual, audiovisual translation techniques. So in Italy, where which is basically still a dubbing country, uh, more and more subtitled uh, audiovisual programs have come uh, uh, to the daily life of uh, Italian citizens. And there was a fear by the dubbing community that this would um, cause problems in terms of professional in terms of a uh, market of job, that the dubber would disappear. But it is not the case, because um, audiovisual products have increased in number and uh, there is more job for dubbers now than uh, that before. The same was true with um, uh, AT, automatic translation. Uh, there was a fear in the translation community that the introduction of AT would cause problems to the community because uh, they said uh, we would disappear. No, uh, the number of uh, translators is increased by the time. So I think that uh, even today it is possible to go out there and explain to people who do conferences that uh, who do who, who organize conferences that it is possible for them to have a different job that audience are asked to read instead of listening but at the same time you get rid of all the technical things and uh, what is more important I, uh, when I say uh, technical uh, things, I mean uh, the booth, I mean uh, receivers, I mean uh, um, the mixer and uh, the, all the technical stuff that is involved uh, in it. At the same time, there is technic there is um, uh, there are machines that are used by interlingual live subtitlers. They are different techniques. They are different techni uh, technological things, uh, but. The, what is more important, the added value of interlingual live subtitling as compared to simultaneous interpreting is the fact that at the end of the, of the meeting you have the possibility of, of, get, of getting the, a, rough, a first draft of what has been said. And to me this is value. So projects like ILSA are uh, very important projects because they focus on something that has a lot of value that is not yet uh, widespread uh, that, uh, because there is a lot of research to do into um, interlingual live subtitling, uh, especially through respeaking. Um, that is why uh, projects like ILSA really go to uh, the right direction because this is the future and re research is, and that's what research has to concentrate on to what now is only partially possible.